Godzilla movies aren't exactly known for having the deepest or well-written human characters. Indeed, when discussing Godzilla movies, or any kaiju movies for that matter, a common sentiment that is almost always guaranteed to come up is apathy towards the human characters, or more specifically, their perceived lack of value to the overall experience. Often, you'll hear the argument that the human characters don't matter, or I only watch for the monsters. And to a certain extent, these points are valid. After all, part of the appeal of watching giant monster movies comes from the visceral of seeing massive creatures destroying cities or fighting an epic battle to the death. As long as a Godzilla movie delivers on this front, it at least can be enjoyed as mindless entertainment. However, with that being said, the fact of the matter is that human characters do matter in these movies, as they do in any movie. They are the means by which we are swept into the action, establishing proper stakes to the monster mayhem we all came to see. The best Godzilla movies are the ones that do this, creating characters that we can root for or root against. And in the 65 plus years Years the Godzilla franchise has been kicking, there have been quite a few memorable characters that have left their mark on the series in their own unique ways. So to celebrate this fact, I thought it would be fun to take a look at some of my personal favorites. These are the humans that have always stuck out to me, the ones that immediately spring to mind when I think of characters in a Godzilla movie. Some are tragic characters, while others are theatrical and over the top, but all are entertaining in their own right. So sit back and relax as we count down the top 10 characters of the Godzilla series. Number 10, Kuronuma, played by Goro Mitsumi, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. The original Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla is one of the best entries of the Showa era for a lot of reasons. It has a fast-paced plot that keeps you engaged, the monster action is explosive and colorful, and its cast of characters is very likable and proactive. But what really puts it over the edge is its villain. No, not Mechagodzilla, the man behind the mechanical doppelganger, the leader of the black hole aliens, Kuronuma. Kuronuma is the type of villain you love to hate. A man, or space ape in this case, who hides how unrepentantly evil he is through a chivalrous and gentlemanly demeanor. You'd think that given his own species is on the brink of extinction that he'd at least show a little remorse to the humans he's attempting to conquer, but there is no nuance to him. He isn't above extorting or torturing people to get his way, even going so far as to roast our heroes alive in what is essentially an overgrown oven when he could have simply just shot them and saved himself the trouble. But that's because he loves showing off how technologically and intellectually superior he is to his enemies, which is funny considering he needs a human scientist to repair Mechagodzilla, but we're not gonna go there. He is smarmy, smug, cocky, and overly confident, which ends up being his downfall. He vastly underestimates human ingenuity, and he pays the price for it. All of this makes for a delightfully entertaining antagonist. He's especially enjoyable in the English dub, thanks to extra hammy line delivery by Michael Ross, which is so good it almost makes the dub the preferred version. Mechagodzilla, beat Godzilla to death. But whether you're watching the English or Japanese version, you'll be sure to find Kuronuma to be one of the most memorable aspects of Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, which is a massive compliment considering how fun the movie is from start to finish. Number 9, Prime Minister Seki Mitamura, played by Kenji Kobayashi, The Return of Godzilla. 1984's aptly titled The Return of Godzilla saw the Monster King return to his darker, grittier roots after a nine-year absence. Gone were the days of dropkicks and dancing. It was a new era with new global and political concerns, and the film explores this, using Godzilla as a symbol for the mounting nuclear tensions brewing between the United States and Soviet Russia at the time, which, needless to say, given Japan's past experience with its destructive power, left the country feeling very nervous. The character that best reflects this tension is Prime Minister Seki Metamura who, despite not being in the movie all that much, at least compared to other characters, is integral to its message, and thus is in many ways the heart of the film. While at first he is hesitant to reveal the existence of Godzilla to the public, when the threat becomes very real, he springs to action, informing the leaders of the world in order to ease tensions, and taking into account both militaristic and scientific solutions. Throughout the film he is shown to be a very calm and thoughtful leader, and Keiju Kobayashi brings a stoic gravitas to the character, often able to say so much with just a simple look. His speech after his meeting with the leaders of the US and Russia is the single best scene in the film, making you understand exactly why he feels the way he does. It's a shame this scene is not present in the American cut. And so Prime Minister Mitamura remains one of the most memorable characters in the Godzilla franchise, for standing up for his principles with mild-mannered elegance. Amidst the screaming of nations, jumping at the chance to pull the trigger on his nation once again, he stands firm in the face of potential annihilation, and that's what makes him a great character. Number 8, Colonel Goro Gondo, played by Toro Minigishi, Godzilla vs. Biolante. 
It's been said a million times, but Godzilla vs. Biollante is one of the most unique entries in the franchise, with regards to both its story and its execution. More thoughtful and poetic than your average Godzilla flick, it explores the potential dangers of genetic engineering, a danger made manifest in the horrifically beautiful Biollante. As such, the film is a fairly serious affair, though there are some times when it is unintentionally hilarious thanks to some truly terrible English-speaking actors. Son of a bitch! It's the Slidian agent again! However, this doesn't mean that the film doesn't have its share of comic relief, most of which comes in the form of Goro Gondo, a colonel in the JSDF. What stands out the most about Goro is his flippant attitude to everything going on around him. While everyone else is treating the situation seriously, Goro kind of just rolls with the punches. He's always cracking wise and making jokes, even in moments where the stakes are immensely high. This is not to say that he doesn't take things as seriously as everyone else. In fact, he's one of the most active characters, putting himself on the front lines to save Japan from Godzilla, but it's clear that he has some sort of admiration for the monster, that it excites him to have an opponent of his stature. This cockiness unfortunately ends up being his undoing, which adds a layer of tragedy to the character that makes him even more appealing. Bringing this all together is Toro Minigishi's performance, which is full of charm and wit that brings much needed levity to the film, but it's never so over the top that it breaks the tone. For all this and more, Goro Gondo ends up being one of the defining characters of Godzilla vs. Biollante, and one of the most most memorable of the franchise. Calm and collected under pressure, he's the man you want on your side when facing off against the King of the Monsters. Number 7, Mr. Taco, played by Ichiro Arashima, King Kong vs. Godzilla. King Kong vs. Godzilla is one of the most important entries in the Godzilla franchise. It brought the monster back after seven years, and through its commercial success, established the formula for all the films that followed. Part of its mass appeal is undoubtedly due to its comedic tone. While the previous two Godzilla films were quite dark tonally and thematically, this film takes a sharp turn in the opposite direction into satire, and no character better represents this turn than Mr. Taco. As the advertising director for Pacific Pharmaceuticals, Mr. Taco is willing to do whatever it takes to boost the ratings of their television programming, and this includes funding an expedition to a mysterious island to kidnap their ape god and bring him back to Japan to become their mascot. Sounds insane, right? Well, that's because it is, and that's the point of the movie. As played brilliantly by comedic actor Ichiro Arashima, Mr. Taco is pure, unfettered capitalism brought to absurd extremes. Through his exaggerated gestures and over-the-top mannerisms, he comes off as an immense buffoon. A likable buffoon, but a buffoon nonetheless. He's just a silly, silly little man, and is thus Thus, very amusing to watch. Of course, his attempts to bring Kong back to Japan only end up in chaos and destruction, but that doesn't stop Mr. Taco from cheering the big guy on. He develops a deep affinity for Kong, and as the conflict between him and the newly awakened Godzilla grows ever closer, he is definitely on Kong's side, treating the whole thing like a wrestling match to be cheered on. Again, this man is responsible for roughly half of the mayhem that takes place across the story, and while that does put a damper on his plans, he takes it all on with a childlike enthusiasm that can't be ignored. This makes Mr. Taco one of the defining faces of one of the most defining films in the Godzilla franchise, thus making him one of those characters you'll never forget. Number 6, Mitsuo Katagiri, played by Hiroshi Abe, Godzilla 2000. Following the disappointments of the US's first attempt at a big-budget Godzilla film, Toho quickly got themselves back into the ring by fast-tracking their own Godzilla film, one that would act as a standalone sequel to the original 54, while also jump-starting a new series. The result was Godzilla 2000 Millennium in 1999, or just Godzilla 2000 when it was released a year later in America. The film ended up being a modest success, and while it has its faults, what it has going for it is an above-average cast of characters, who are likable and engaged with the plot the most memorable of which is the film's human antagonist, Mitsuo Katagiri. The best villains are the ones you understand, and Katagiri fits this mold perfectly. As opposed to the hero of the story, Yuri Shinoda, who wants to observe and study Godzilla, Katagiri simply wants to kill Godzilla, because he realizes what a danger he poses to Japan. And he isn't wrong, and that's what makes him a great character. While we as Godzilla fans certainly understand where Shinoda is coming from, Katagiri's logic cannot be faulted. His job is to protect the citizens of Japan, and he 
he takes his job seriously, doing whatever he feels must be done to do so. His flaw is that he is so sure of himself that he can't see beyond his own perception. That, and he's just a terrible guy, willing even to kill an old friend to get him out of the way. Still though, we can't help but like him in certain ways thanks to a commanding performance by Hiroshi Abe, who is able to convey so much through a simple, cold stare. And so Mitsuo Katagiri ends up being one of the most memorable aspects of Godzilla 2000, and is definitely a contender for one of the franchise's best antagonists. Because unlike a lot of them, he has nuance. He doesn't just chew the scenery or cackle maniacally, though there is some of that. The bottom line is that he brings a valuable perspective to one of the series' most often pondered questions, and that makes him one of its most valuable characters. Number 5, Dr. Kyohei Yamane, played by Takashi Shimura, Godzilla. The original 1954 Godzilla is an important film for many reasons, one of which is the overall effect it had on the Japanese film industry. It popularized special effects films and jump-started an entire genre, and in doing so introduced and established many of the common tropes and archetypes that we come to expect. One such archetype is the troubled scientist figure, the man or woman who goes against the grain and sees the monster not as an enemy of man, but a tragic figure of nature that should be studied, not destroyed. This archetype can practically be found in every kaiju movie, and it all started here with the character of Dr. Yamane, played by the great Takashi Shimura. Dr. Yamane is the quintessential wise scientist character, a man who cloaks his scientific curiosity with a kindly and soft-mannered demeanor. Being a paleontologist, he is naturally drawn to the tragic events that befalls Odo Island at the beginning of the film, and is the first to suggest that a large creature of some kind is responsible. And once his hunch is proven correct, and he presents the existence of Godzilla to Japan, the country wastes no time trying to kill him. An understanding response, but Dr. Yamane cannot help but lament the loss of such a valuable specimen and the scientific knowledge that would be lost with it. Once Godzilla destroys Tokyo, however, Yamane has no choice but to support the plan to use Dr. Serizawa's oxygen destroyer to kill the monster, but it is a decision he knows does not come lightly. He is given the final word of the film, acknowledging the tragic nature of both Godzilla and Serizawa, and the dangerous precedent they set for the future. It's an immensely somber note to end the film on, and that it's given to Dr. Yamane is no accident. He may not influence the plot as much as other characters, but he is integral to its heart, providing the intellectual foundation for everything that transpires. Dr. Yamane may not be as flashy as similar types of characters that would pop up later in the franchise, but he carries a quiet wisdom that few have ever matched, making him one of its best characters. Number 4, Captain Douglas Gordon, played by Don Fry, Godzilla Final Wars. Released in 2004, Godzilla Final Wars was meant to be both a celebration of the then 50-year-old franchise and an early conclusion to the Millennium series, which had been underperforming consistently since it started six years earlier. As such, it went all out with a fast-paced and frantic style, and a huge cast of both the human and monster variety that spans the decades. The movie is absolutely bonkers, over the top in a way that's either great or terrible depending on who you ask, and the character that best symbolizes this is the meat-headed, mustache-wearing samurai sword-wielding Captain Douglas Gordon. As the captain of the warship Gotengo, Captain Gordon is on the front lines in the fight to protect the Earth from the threat of giant monsters. He's dependable and will do whatever it takes to complete the mission, which ruffles the feathers of his superiors, who don't appreciate his willingness to stretch the rules or disobey orders. This gets him into trouble a lot, but it's exactly this rebellious streak that makes him the ally needed to save the world from the Exilian invasion. On the surface, this sounds fairly typical, but UFC fighter Don Fry brings a strange charisma to the character that can't be ignored. Somehow he's simultaneously over the top and deadpan. A combination that shouldn't work, and maybe it doesn't, but regardless, it makes for a very entertaining character that brings a lot of laughs to the movie. In essence, Captain Gordon is an absurd American caricature, whose cocky, no BS attitude stands in stark contrast to the rest of the Japanese cast. You're not meant to take him seriously, just like you're not meant to take the film itself seriously. His appeal is certainly subjective. There are viewers who will hate every moment this guy's on screen. But if you enjoy over-the-top entertainment, then it's hard to imagine this character not endearing himself to you. Captain Gordon may lack nuance, but his ridiculous nature makes him one of the franchise's best characters. Number 3, Rando Yaguchi, played by Hiroki Hasegawa, Shin Godzilla. 
With the 2014 American Godzilla film having proven a solid commercial success, Toho wasted no time setting in motion a revival of their own, one that would strongly set itself apart from its western counterpart. The resulting film is a fast-paced procedural that connects the monster to the anxieties Japan currently had concerning government incompetency amidst national crises. As such, the film skewers and parodies the Japanese government while at the same time showcasing the country's spirit via a gallery of scientific and political outsiders, headed by Rando Yaguchi, the closest thing the film has to a main character. On the surface, Rando seems like a rather milquetoast protagonist. We don't know much about him outside of his ever-growing and increasingly complicated job, and his motivations are rather simplistic. He wants to climb the ladder of power within the Japanese government, and is frustrated by the bureaucratic red tape holding him back. But Rando isn't interested in power for power's sake. He actually cares about serving Japan for the greater good. And this is demonstrated through the subtleties of the character, and the way he is developed through action rather than exposition. While his more experienced colleagues are hindered by the old ways of doing things, Rando is a man of practicality, something he demonstrates when he assembles his merry band of misfits into an egalitarian effort where rank and file are dissolved and all perspective and ideas are allowed to flourish. He's also incredibly perceptive. He's the first one to humor the idea that they are dealing with a marine animal of some sort, something the others scoff at. Later, he is shown to have a healthy level of skepticism of the U.S.'s interest in the situation, and in doing so develops a mutually beneficial relationship with the nation's representative, Kyoko Ann Patterson. And when the country is threatened with the possibility of an A-bomb being dropped on Tokyo, he helps scramble together a plan with his team that ends up saving the day via unconventional means. Basically, Rando Yaguchi is the ideal politician, someone who doesn't allow endless theoreticals and outdated traditions stop him from serving in Japan's best interest. He is a simple character, but within the story of Shin Godzilla, this is a virtue, giving him a strength of resolve that saves Japan and the world from Godzilla. And that makes him one of the franchise's most heroic characters. Number 2, Glenn, played by Nick Adams, Invasion of Astro Monster. Invasion of Astro Monster is commonly thought to be one of the best films of the Showa era for a variety of reasons. Not only did it bring back King Ghidorah, further cementing him as one of Godzilla's most iconic enemies, but it also expanded the scope of the series, bringing it into a hypothetical future where man has conquered space travel, smoothly leading into what would be the first of many alien invasion plots where mind-controlled monsters are used to conquer Earth. But what really makes the film stand out is its above-average cast of human characters, the most memorable of which is the charismatic, smooth-talking astronaut Glenn. What makes Glenn such an icon within the Godzilla franchise isn't so much the character but the actor that plays him. American actor Nick Adams brings wit and charm to the character, making you instantly like him. This is enhanced by the symbolic friendship he has with his fellow astronaut Kazuo Fuji, played by Toho stalwart Akira Takarada. The two have a palpable chemistry on screen that carries the film and efficiently gets you invested in their characters. There's also his tragic relationship with the Exilian secret agent Miss Namikawa, played by the beautiful Kumi Mizuno which adds real emotional gravitas to the story that few Godzilla films have. They're not on screen together all that much, but again, the chemistry between the two is enough that you can easily buy into it. It's no wonder then that these two had since become one of the most iconic duos of the series. So good is Adams as Glenn that he is considered by many to be an indispensable part of the viewing experience. This presents quite a conundrum as Adams is dubbed over for the Japanese cut, meaning that much of his performance is lost. This makes the American dub a cherished alternative cut that even purists admit to enjoying. It's a rare thing for the American version of a Godzilla film to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with its original Japanese version, but Invasion of Astro Monster is that rare case, and it's mostly due to this character, and the invaluable contribution Nick Adams brought to the picture, thus making him one of the franchise's most invaluable characters. Number 1, Dr. Daisuke Serizawa, played by Akihiko Hirata, Godzilla. It's hard to compete with the original 1954 Godzilla for many reasons. As a Godzilla movie, as a film, and as a work of art, it is a cut above the rest of the entries in the series with regards to its direction, story, theme, and characterization. No, the characters in Godzilla won't be winning any awards for nuance or depth, but as points of view to root the story in and explore its then very relevant fears regarding the dawn of the nuclear age, they are quite well done. And at the forefront of this exploration is the immensely tragic and instantly iconic Dr. Daisuke Serizawa. With 
any first viewing of Godzilla, Dr. Serizawa is a character that sneaks up on you. He isn't given much focus in the first half of the film. What we know is that he is a war veteran, that he is a scientist, and that he is arranged to be married to Dr. Yamane's daughter, Emiko, who, while having a great respect for Serizawa, does not love him, and is instead in love with sailor Hideto Ogata. This love triangle is tragic enough, but then Serizawa shows Emiko something truly terrifying, and it isn't until the conclusion of the film that we are shown what it is, the Oxygen Destroyer, a weapon so potentially devastating that he agrees to use it on Godzilla on one condition, that it can only be used once. Easy enough to say, but Dr. Serizawa ensures this by taking his own life with it, thus taking all his potential destruction with him to a watery grave. It's a brilliantly sad end to one of the series' most brilliant characters, one whose mark continues to be felt to this day. Merely mention the name Serizawa, or bring up an image of a scientist with an eye patch, and every Godzilla fan knows who it is. This is all of course thanks to a wonderful performance by Akihiko Hirata, who brings a solemn intensity to the character that subtly conveys the weight of the world on his shoulders, and he carries it with a quiet grace all the way until the end, where he sacrifices himself, wishing the woman he loves a happy life. Dr. Serizawa continues to remain the best character in the Godzilla series because he is the heart of the original film that started it all. He represents science at its best and its worst. A man of immense moral character who creates the ultimate weapon, one that even the indestructible Godzilla cannot survive. His sacrifice is a solemn warning that without a conscience to guide it, scientific exploration can give birth to monsters. It's the franchise's most powerful message, delivered by its most iconic character. Thank you so much for watching. Do you have any favorite characters from the Godzilla series? Let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to Up From The Depths for more great Godzilla content. Thanks again for watching, and as always, long live the king.